What an amazing morning so far, would you agree? So great to have you here. Would you open your Bibles to Revelation chapter 3 as we conclude our series, Listen Up. Um, we've gone to uh, the six of the seven churches, and uh, we are now on the seventh church. How, how many of you um, have a weak stomach? Anybody here have a weak stomach? Yeah, a few of you. Um, what, what kind of things trigger that? You know, it makes sense if you eat something bad that your body wants to reject it, right? But what, what, is it that, what is it that causes you to want to empty your stomach out? Um, what triggers that? Like when you, when you want to just let it all out. You know, I've known people that they get this way when they get nervous. Like if I came out to you and I said to you right now, hey, could, could you come up here and share a, a quick testimony of what God has done in your life? If I asked you to come up, some people would go, dang, it makes them want to throw up in their mouth. You know, like I don't even want to go up there. And some people feel this way because they get extremely sad or upset. Like if you've ever heard shocking news, like sh sometimes it makes you sick, right? And a lot of times we have this reaction when we encounter something really disgusting, like taking a drink out of a milk carton and you feel the lump go down. You ever, anybody ever done that? Yeah. So <laughs> here, here's the point. When something is so offensive to you that it makes you want to vomit, that's kind of serious. If Jesus says something makes him feel this way, it would be wise to us to pay, pay very close attention. And this is what he's teaching us in Revelation chapter 3. What do you think makes Jesus feel this way? Well, is it Christians that are too political or maybe political about the wrong things? Is it Christians that don't give? Is it Christians that show up late to church? Is it Christians who conform to the culture of this world? Here's the answer. The answer is it's a lukewarm Christian. That's what makes him want to vomit. And a lukewarm Christian, that's kind of an oxymoron. You know, an oxymoron is when contradictory terms appear in conjunction. In other words, when you have two words that are completely different right next to each other. For example, jumbo shrimp, tight, tight slacks, uh, government efficiency, airline food, <laughs> adorable cat. I'm sorry. Did I just say that out loud? And then, and then Microsoft works, right? So these things are, 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 are oxymorons. And the biggest one of all is lukewarm Christian. Someone who believes in Jesus but doesn't want to follow him wholeheartedly. As we studied over the past seven weeks, we've learned that in chapters 2 and 3 of Revelation that Jesus wrote letters. He spoke words to the seven churches in Asia Minor. And these were actually churches that were in existence at that time. And many scholars believe that it's a representation of all the churches in every age. So as we approach this Christmas season, which is when we talk about the first coming of Jesus to our earth, I want you to know Revelation talks about the second coming of Christ. And you really can't understand the first coming without truly understanding the second coming. Today we're going to see a picture of how Jesus feels about a church that is lukewarm in its passion for him. We're going to begin in Revelation chapter 3, verse 14. To the angel of the church in Laodicea, write. Now, angel means to the leader or to the representative. It could be the pastor or it could be an angel that was assigned to watch over that church. A, a few things to know about Laodicea. First, Laodicea was extremely, it was ex extraordinarily wealthy. It, it had so much money. Years before this letter was written, um, Laodicea actually had burnt to the ground, and it was rebuilt from scratch by one of the wealthiest families in the Roman Empire, named uh, the Zeno Zenonads. They actually rebuilt the city. This one family rebuilt the entire city. Secondly, it's important to understand that they were a textile center. They produced fine black wool that came from a breed of rare sheep that lived in the surrounding mountains. Rich people came to shop there. That's where rich people would go to shop. It was kind of like the Oscar de la Renta of the ancient world. And if you know anything about Oscar de la Renta, the minimum purchase when you go in there is about 3600 bucks. Finally, it was a medical center in the Roman Empire. The surrounding mountains contained a lot of hot mineral springs, and they were thought of as having healing qualities. So Laodicea became um, a medical center, and they came up with a lot of legitimate medical cures that, they were, that were developed there, kind of like essential oils and stuff like that. So here's this church which is an offspring of Paul's uh, missionary journeys. And in fact, if you read the letter that Paul wrote to the Colossians, he actually 
wrote, he mentions, he references a letter that he wrote to the Laodicean church, which they obviously ignored. But let, let's continue with verse 14. The angel of the church in Laodicea write the amen. And now that's a Hebrew word that means um, certainty or end of the story. The amen, the faithful and true witness, the origin of the creation of God says this, verse 15. I know your deeds, that you are neither cold nor hot. I wish that you were cold or hot. Verse 16. So because you are lukewarm and neither hot nor cold, I will vomit you out of my mouth. Neither hot nor cold. See, six miles southeast of Laodicea were the surrounding regions of Hierapolis, which contained all of these boiling mineral springs that were believed to have healing power. And six miles to the northwest were the tall mountains of Colossae, out of which streams of ice-cold water flowed from the melting snow. Now, these two streams flowed right down in these pools. They, they met together in, in, the, in the pools outside of Laodicea, and they were combined with this kind of stagnant pond that had tepid water. They were neither hot, that pond was neither hot, which was good for bathing and for healing, nor was it cold, which was good for a refreshing drink. Either hot or cold is good, but lukewarm is, is not good for anybody. If, how many love a hot cup of coffee in the morning? Yeah, and then on a, on a hot day, how many love a, a nice cold glass of iced tea, right? Yeah, absolutely. But if you pick up that hot cup of coffee at some point, and you're thinking you're drinking a hot cup of coffee, and it's lukewarm, you're, you like, ugh, right? Don't you? You like spit it out. Well, what he says next is super important because it explains why they're lukewarm. It explains why the Laodiceans are lukewarm. Verse 17 says, because you say, I am rich and I have become wealthy and I have no need for anything. I told you that the Laodiceans were rich. Um, here's how rich. In AD 61, there was an earthquake in the valley that they were all in that measured eight plus on the Richter scale. Every city in the region was, was absolutely demolished. It was destroyed. And Roman federal funds were granted to each city so that each city could rebuild. And do you know what um, Laodicea said? We don't need your government money. We can handle it ourselves. And they rebuilt the city on their own. Now, when was the last time that happened in history where, where people said no to free money? When was the last time that ever happened? Turning down free money. Laodicea, they were proud. They were self-sufficient. And there was this, and this sense of self-sufficiency actually infiltrated in the church. They thought, we're all right. We got this. They weren't people who cried out desperately for God because they usually had it all under control. And, and because of that, verse 17, and you do not know that you are wretched, wretched miserable, poor, blind, and naked. See, the Laodiceans had developed a, this eye ointment that could cure a lot of vision and ailments in those days. So people from around the world would come to get this ointment in order to get their eyes healed. Jesus is saying to them, the irony is, is that you've created this ointment, but you're blind. This ointment can't heal your eyes. He said, you are clothed with a very fine black wool, but in my eyes, you're naked. Verse 18 says, I advise you to buy, me, buy from me gold refined by fire so that you may become rich. In other words, you need a different kind of gold. You never noticed. Here's what he's telling them. You've never noticed that you're blind and you're naked and you don't even realize it. You see, have you ever noticed that some of the, the richest people have the worst family relationships? Have you ever noticed that? The wealthiest people have some terrible family relationships? That's because earthly gold can't fix soul brokenness. Worldly riches can't make you kind. Worldly riches can't make you loving. Worldly riches can't even satisfy you. Here's what it says in Isaiah 55.1. You there, everyone who thirsts, come to the waters, and you who have no money, come, buy and eat. Come, buy wine and milk without money and without cost. Why spend money on what's not fulfilling, and why, why labor in what does not satisfy you? You know, there, there is a food that satisfies Garments that cover, treasures that give security. But you gain it through money, Laodicean church. You gain it through money. You have to receive it by faith, and you have to surrender. Verse 18 says, and white garments 
so that you may clothe yourself and the shame of your nakedness will not be revealed. Revelation says that those who stand in God's presence are dressed in spotless white clothing. Here's what it says in Revelation 7, 14. I said to him, my Lord, you know. And he said to me, these are the ones who come out of the great tribulation. And they have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the lamb. If you wash something in your own blood, how many have had blood on their clothes or something and you wash it? What happens? The blood comes out into the water, right? You wash something in your own blood or you wash something in the blood of somebody you know, the, what happens is things get red. <laughs> Think, things get stained with red, right? But, but when you wash it in the blood of Jesus, it turns white as snow. See, there's, there's, it depends on whose blood you wash it in. How, how many remember? What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Come on. Oh, precious is the flow that makes me white as snow. No other fount I know. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. See, the, the kind of clothes we need is not from the wool, the wool of rare sheep, but it's from the skin of the spotless blood of the Lamb of God. You need, it says, verse 18, he tells him, you need eye salve, you need an ointment to apply to your eyes so that you can see. He says, the problem isn't your physical eyes. The problem is the eyes of your soul. You love the wrong things. You evaluate things poorly. Medicine can't help that. So verse 20 says, behold, I stand at the door and knock. That's an upsetting image. I mean, if you really think about it, what is Jesus doing on the outside of the church? What's he doing on the outside of the church? Even worse, they've gotten so self-sufficient, they don't even realize he's not there anymore. How do you not notice that Jesus isn't a part of what your life is, what you're doing? How do you not notice that? You know, I always hear this scripture in reference to salvation. You know, he knocks on the door of the unbeliever, which, which, is, which is totally fine. I mean, it's a great application. But here specifically, he's talking to the church. He's talking about the church. He says, a church so satisfied and competent that they don't even recognize Jesus isn't there. What a scripture... Or what a picture of the church in America today. When Christians in poor parts of the world come to the United States and they visit our churches, they're appalled by our, loop, our lukewarmness, by how little we pray, how little we give, how much we spend on ourselves and, and what we think we can't live without. They are appalled at how afraid we are to identify ourselves as Christians in public when some of them are literally being persecuted by their faith, for their faith. We have become the way of Laodicea. We have become the Laodicean church. Look, lukewarm does not mean hypocritical, by the way. Uh, a hypocrite is a liar. These people in Laodicea, they, they were pretty consistent. They didn't feel that they, they were desperate for God. They, they, they reflected, uh, and that is reflected in their lukewarmness, in their obedience, and their lameness in worship. Jesus says the most negative thing he could say to anybody. He doesn't say, I'm angry with you or I'm disappointed in you. He didn't say that. Why do you, he, he says, I want to vomit. He says, why do, you think he, why do you think he had this response? Why do you think Jesus wanted to vomit? Why do you think he wanted to vomit? Here's why. Jesus sees it as a disrespectful response to grace. I mean, think about it. After he claimed to be who he said he was going to be and what he did for us, I mean, after everything he did for us, dying on the cross, everything he did for us, there's only really two responses that make sense to Jesus. One of them is worship, and the other one is mockery. It's either worship or it's mockery. What doesn't make sense is boredom. That doesn't make sense. People in the New Testament are never bored with Jesus. They're either pa they either passionately hate him, and they call out for his crucifixion, or they passionately love him, and they fall to his feet and they worship. But you never see people who are bored. Yet that's precisely what lukewarm people are to Jesus. 
which means that they don't really understand who Jesus is or understand the desperate condition they're in without him. Allow me to explain why. Uh, uh, let me explain it to you this way. Let's say that you're out all day and you come home and your friend's sitting on your porch. And your friend says to you, hey, um, a guy came by that you owed money to and um, he w came to collect and I, I paid it for you. How would you respond to that? Well, it would depend on how much he paid or how much she paid, right? Because like if the postman came by and says, hey, I need an, an extra 20 cents to deliver this message and the guy paid 20 cents, you're like, hey, cool, thanks so much. I appreciate that. Th thanks for doing that. But if the guy says, hey, I didn't, I didn't know you had a gambling addiction. Guido came by, man. He wanted 500,000 bucks. He said that, that he was going to kill you if he didn't get the $500,000, so I paid your debt for you. All of a sudden you go, dude, man, I, I love you. I, thank you. Thank you for that, right? Thank you so much. I, mean, I can't believe you did that. I, I can't believe what you've done for me. I mean, you, you saved my life. I'm, I'm in awe. I'm, I'm in shock. Thank you. You saved my life, right? A little different. So why in the world do we treat Jesus like he just paid 20 cents on a stamp? I mean, where in the world would we be without Jesus? In light of who Jesus is and all that he's done for us, a bored reaction doesn't make any sense. There are only two possible reactions. One is total worship, and the other is total mockery. You've got to make up your mind. You're going to be hot, you're going to be cold. Is he who he says he is? Did he do what he said he was going to that he, what he said he was going to do? Is eternity what he said it is? Did he die on the cross for your sin like he said he did? So the second reason that makes it, that it makes him one of vomit is B, it tells the world a lie about him. I mean, the single biggest cause of atheism are people who have lived with people who claim that they love God, but they're not distinct in any way of the world. They're not, they're not distinct. They're no different than the world. Listen, if you listen to the story of atheists, a lot of them, the majority of them, grew up in a Christian home, grew up in the church. The problem was they didn't see the passion for Jesus that of the people that were raising them. They didn't see it in their behavior. They didn't see it in their mor morality. Basically, they, they grew up with people that said they were Christians, but they looked no different than the world. So why do I need to believe? They were the same temperature of everyone around them. When we do not live differently than the world lives, we tell a lie about who God is. See, we tell the world that God has no transforming power, and this is as good as it's going to get. When people you know are, are Christians, but they're not passionate about Jesus, it tells people that there's not much to be excited about, that our lives are, and our morals are, I, I'm, I'm going to tell you, our lives, our morals, our giving, are all supposed to scream his worthiness. All of, all of what we do are supposed to scream his worthiness. It's why worship is so important. We're not just singing for Jesus, although he loves that, and he, he, he appreciates that, and he, it's, it's awesome. We're also singing for each other. Did you know that? We're also worshiping for each other. It puts the worth of Jesus on display when we worship. And if we stand there with a, co a cup of coffee in our hand in our pocket with a bored look on our face or flicking through our phone or talking to our friend while we're in worship, we're letting people know that Jesus isn't that awesome. We're letting the people around us know that Jesus isn't that big of a deal. Lukewarm worship tells people that God is not that great and he hasn't done that much for us. Listen to what Martin Luther King wrote in, from a Birmingham jail in regards to Revelation chapter 2 and 3. He said, there was a time when the church was very powerful. In the time when the early Christians rejoiced at being deemed worthy to suffer for what they believed. In, do, in those days, the church was not merely a thermometer that recorded the ideas and principles of popular opinion. It was the thermostat that transformed society. Small in number, they were big in commitment. They were too God-intoxicated to be numerically intimidated. But their effort and example, they, by, by their effort and example, they brought an end to such ancient evils as, um, as infanticide, and gladiator games. And infanticide is when they would sacrifice children, usually less than a year old. They, 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 he said, you know, they eliminated things like that. Things are different now, he wrote. And if today's church does not recapture the sacrificial spirit of the early church, it will lose its authenticity. 
forfeit the loyalty of millions and be dismissed as, irrevel as an irrelevant social club with no meaning for the 20th century. He wrote, every day I meet young people whose disappointment with the church has turned into outright disgust. Here's the irony. We thought the more we became like them, the world, the more that they would accept us. We thought that the more we hung out in bars and smoked cigarettes and drank alcohol and did a little weed with the world that they would accept us as Christians. We thought the more we became like them, the more they would accept us. But actually what happened is we became irrelevant to them and disgusting to Jesus. So what does a, a lukewarm Christian look like? Number one, they desire acceptance by people more than God. See, we're, we're people who, who crave appro approval by others, don't, don't we? I mean, look at any, any social media platform. Count the selfies. We, we, right? And, and what do we do after we take a selfie? We are continually looking at how many likes we got. And if we got a lot of likes, oh, man, we're on cloud nine. But if we didn't get a, that many likes, we're like, oh, man, we're depressed. Oh, God, nobody liked that one. Nobody, nobody. Now, what do I got to do different? Or, or, or we don't want to... We don't want to be regarded as weird either, right? So we conform our morals to everybody else's morals. Like I'll take my cues from the culture, not from the scripture. Um, the point is your life is shaped by what other people think, not what God thinks. When you're making decisions, your, your first thought is not how God feels, but how other people feel or how other people think. You, you give weight to what others think over God. And, and I didn't say that you rejected God. I just said you don't think about it much. The second the second one uh, description of a lukewarm Christian is they rarely share their faith in Christ. They consider themselves Christians, but they don't want to make people uncomfortable by talking about religious things or spiritual things, so they rarely bring it up. How could you, how could you really believe the gospel is true and not tell anybody about it? How can you really believe that there's a hell and not warn people about that? Uh, there is a, a couple that's in Las Vegas called Penn and Teller. You might, you might have heard of them. They're illusionists. They, they, they work out there. Penn is actually an atheist. Somebody asked him one time. They said, um, they said, does it bother you that every time you come out of a, a show, there's a Christian there trying to convert you? And he says, not at all. He says, the ones that bug me are the ones that don't try. Because if they believe that hell is real, why wouldn't they tell me about it? He said, if, you believe, if you're a Christian and you know that there's a hell that people will go to if they don't accept Jesus Christ, how much do you have to hate somebody in order not to tell them? Jesus said, if you confess me before men, I will confess you before my Father. But if you do not, I will not confess you before my Father in heaven. I think a lot of reasons the lukewarm Christians are like this is that, is that they say they believe the gospel, but they've never really felt the the power transforming their lives. And so they don't tell others about the power that could transform their lives. It's a lot of times, yeah, a lot of times what happens is we don't completely surrender. We don't completely surrender the process. So we're holding the power up to come and effectively change us, to transform us. Because we still want to, we still want to do things our way but we, we want this power over here. We want this change, but, but we like this. The world is still good enough. So, so we stick on both, both, both feet. We got both feet going here and there. So, right. so we don't transform like we want to. So we don't tell others about it because we haven't totally transformed. We, we, we don't see that power, so we don't tell anybody. The third is they rationalize their sin. Lukewarm Christians don't really hate sin. They just don't want to be thought of as bad people. So they're constantly asking, how close can I come to sin without looking as, as if I'm a bad person? When you, when you ask that, you're not motivated by your love for Jesus. See, if I love my wife and I take her out on a date, I'm not asking what's the minimum amount I could do to get away with this evening. I'm not asking that. I'm not, I'm not saying what's the cheapest meal I can buy for her. What is the minimum amount I... I can talk to her and still get away with the evening. Or, or what's the maximum I can flirt with the waitress and still be okay? See, if I'm motivated by love, I want to draw close to her. I want to I wanna please her. I want to delight in her. You know, when I'm motivated for love for Jesus, I want to draw close to him. I want to please him. I want to delight in him. I'm not asking how close can I come to sin and get away with it. 
No, I'm asking, what can I do to make you happy? When you're not motivated by love for Jesus, you're thinking, how close can I get to sin and still be okay? I've heard it said this way, lukewarm Christians don't really want to be saved from sin. They just don't want to pay the penalty. We don't hate sin. We just hate, hate the thought of going to hell. Number four, lukewarm, lukewarm Christians think more about the present than the future. See, lukewarm Christians think about life on earth more than eternity in heaven. Uh, Philippians 1.21, Paul said, For to me to live is Christ and to die is gain. That basically meant that Paul, my, Paul said, Man, everything about my life is about Jesus Christ. I'm so excited about my life in Jesus Christ. Everything about me, every ounce of fiber about me is about Jesus Christ. I get to serve him. But if I die, that's an upgrade. If I go to heaven, that's an upgrade. See, what's the attitude of America, though? I don't, I don't want to die. I don't want to die. I, I want to live as long as possible. I'd rather be 105-year-olds in diapers than die. We try to hold on to our youth as long as possible and cram so much in our lives, as much as possible, because we don't want to miss out. Because why? Because we think this is it. This is it. Real Christians live as if eternity is right around the corner. They love life, but they're not obsessed with the bucket list because they know they're going to get that all in eternity. Christians should never be part of the YOLO club. You know that you only live once club? When, when Christians say, do it, man, do it, you only live once, I go, no, we don't. We live for eternity. Are you kidding me? Number five, they only turn to God when they need something. And, and you know what? I, like, I, I'm, still, I'm cool with that. Like, I'm all right with that because if a need brings you back to God, amen, amen, right? But if you're just trying to fix, use him to fix something all the time and that you haven't figured out that he's really what life is all about, that the point of your life is actually living for him, uh, I, I see it all the time. A need brings you back to God, like joblessness or a divorce or kids or, or a health scare. And then you, we get all on fire for Jesus. But lukewarm Christians only turn to God when they need something or feel like they're in trouble. It's like putting God on a timeout. You know what I mean? God, you're on a timeout. Just, just hang out right there, and I'll let you know when you can come out. I'll let, you, I'll let you know. And then when we sin or we get in trouble, okay, okay, hey, hey, come on out. Come on out. Then everything's cool. We go, can you go back now? See, lukewarm Christians love their luxuries and rarely, well, lukewarm Christians only turn to God when they need something. Number, number six, they only give when it's convenient. See, they'll, they'll give when it makes you look good or when it makes them feel good. But they're like, the, don't, don't push me to give. It's my stuff. Don't, 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 don't push me. It's my stuff. So they give God the leftovers. Not their first and not their best. Luke, lukewarm Christians love the luxuries and rarely give to the poor in a truly sacrificial way. Lukewarm Christians are motivated by stories about people who do radical things for Christ when it comes to giving. You know the stories where people say, I, I emptied out my bank account. I gave everything away because God told me to. I mean, they love those stories. Yet, they don't do radical things themselves. God says, if it doesn't represent your first or your best, I don't want it. Do you remember last week we talked about Cain and Abel? And we talked about how Cain, when he got around to it, he gave, he gave an offering. But Abel gave of his first fruits. The prophet Malachi talked a, 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 about a, a, a bunch of priests who actually gave God an offering. And, but they would keep the best animals for themselves, and they would pass on to God the, the less desirable animals. They assumed God, God was pleased because at least they were giving something. They were sacrificing something. They were giving them the less desirable, but we're giving you at least something. So they figured he's pleased. Yet, God described this practice as evil. Look what it says in Malachi 1.8. And when you present a blind animal for sacrifice, is it not evil? Or when you present a lame or sick animal, is it not evil? So offer it to your governor, he says. Would he be pleased with you or would he receive you kindly? Says the Lord of armies. Isn't that funny what God said? Say, hey, offer it, to your, uh, offer it to your governor and see if he'd like it. See, this was not merely inadequate. Giving lame animals was not merely inadequate of God's point of view. It was evil. It was evil. If your giving does not represent your first or your best, it's evil to God. 
Stop calling your complacency, your apathy, a busy schedule or, or bills or forgetfulness. Call it what it is, evil. Jesus wants and deserves the first and your best. And the seventh and final description of a lukewarm Christian is they look like the world. Lukewarm Christians are not much different than the rest of the world. Remember, remember the water at Laodicea was neither hot nor like the springs of the south or, or were they cold like the rivers of the north. It was room temperature. It was indistinct. Lukewarm Christians are like that in the relationship in the world around them. They're, they're just like that. They, they look the same as everybody else. They watch the same movies as everybody else. They listen to the same music as everybody else. They use the same filthy language as everybody else. They possess the same morals as everybody else. They raise their kids like everybody else, and they prioritize what everyone else around them prioritizes. If we have difficulties in our marriage, we turn to divorce just as often as everyone else. I'm not saying that's not a complex question. I'm just trying to let you know that, and I'm not sending a blanket judgment over everything. I'm just saying that we're not that distinctive. We're not... We're more like them than we are him. We live comfortably, self-sufficiently, indistinct in our passion, our morality, our sacrificial way of living. These are the kind of people Jesus calls lukewarm. And they make him want to vomit. <laughs> it's an insult to his majesty and grace and confuses people who, about who he really is. A pastor said it this way once. The way I was doing the work of God destroyed the work of God in me. Maybe this is a word to some of us today. You've become a full-time mom or a businessman or a student or, a part, or, or, or whatever it is your occupation is, and you've, come, you've, you've become a part-time follower of Jesus Christ. It's not a coincidence that Laodicea was the wealthiest, was the best, had the best resources, best singers, best facility, funniest preachers and biggest budgets, and they were the ones that were lukewarm. Pride and self-sufficiency always breed lukewarm passion. The poor, the desperate, those consumed by guilt or regret, they know that they have a need for God and they cling on to him. I mean, you couldn't separate them from God more than you could separate a scuba diver from his air tanks. They cling on to God. But those who are accomplished, those who are, who are praised by the world, those who have it all together, those who are financially secure, those who feel like they're generally good people, they are the ones who grow lukewarm. They never outright deny him, but they marginalize him. They fulfill their religious duties, but their lives are not characterized by sacrificial or sacrifice of great ventures of faith. Well, this passage, as jolting as it is, how many can say that this was a hard word to receive today, right? I mean, it, it's, a tough, it's a tough word, but it ends with good news. Verse 19 says, those whom I love, I rebuke and discipline, not because he's angry, or because he hates us, because he loves us. It says, therefore, be zealous and repent. Tells us what to do. Be zealous and repent. Behold, verse 20 says, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him, and I will dine with him, and he with me. The good news is he wants to come in. He wants to wake you up. Will you let him in? See, how might Jesus knock to us? How might, how might Jesus knock? Let me, let me tell you. He'll knock through consequences, right? We may have done something that put us in a situation that we're, we're reaping the consequences. We're having to walk through something because of what we've done. Anybody ever been there? Well, well, he'll come to us in those situations. He'll also come to us in circumstances. Like I mentioned earlier, difficulties, problem with kids. Someone here expect, uh, experiencing a crisis moment right now in your marriage. Maybe a health scare. That's God knocking, trying to get our attention. He also will knock through conviction. Maybe everything's going well in your life, and God is saying to you right now, I'm not your first. I'm not the first thing in your life, and I should be. Maybe you're being convicted right now because you're, you haven't put God first in your life. A lot of other stuff has become first. Verse 21 says, the one who overcomes, I will grant to him to sit with me on my throne, as I also overcame and sat with my father on his throne. Verse 22 the one who has an ear, let him hear what the scripture says to the churches. Yeah, lukewarm Christian is an oxymoron. It's either worship or mockery. You have to choose. You can't do both. Charles Spurgeon said, no one, there's no one more miserable than a half committed Christian. Just enough into God, just enough into the world. You never get to experience the joy of sacrifice, the joy that comes from feeling his pleasure. 
It's kind of like the, the man on a, on a dock. You, you, you read the scriptures where it talks about Jesus getting in a boat, you know. It, and you, you've read those scriptures. Jesus gets in a boat. So you're the guy on the dock. You're the, you're the lady or the man on the dock. And, and all of a sudden you see get Jesus getting in a boat. What do you want to do, man? You, 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 you want to get in that boat. So you get a foot. You get, hey, Jesus, I want to come with you. But man, that boat over here, the one that the world's in, the one that has all the fun and all the stuff that you grew up with and all the things you remember and the drugs and the alcohol and all the stuff that makes you check out and you go, but that, you know what I'll do? I'll just, I'll just put, I'll just put my, foot in the, my foot in this boat and then I got my other foot here with Jesus. And, and whenever, I, whenever I want more Jesus, I'll just lean in a little bit. But I'd like to spend some time in the world once in a while too. Can I just tell you, if you got your foot in both, bo- both boats, you're eventually going to tear apart. You're eventually going to split. There's going to be traumatic things that happen to you when you split. And so I, you got to, listen, if you're going to be saved, be all the way saved. If you're going to follow Jesus, be all the way in. Don't be half-hearted. Don't be lukewarm. Our Jesus deserves more than a lukewarm devotion. He died for us. He healed our diseases through his pain. He clothed us, he clothed us with his flesh. He gave us riches through his poverty. When you realize that, when you realize he gave up everything for each and every one of us, all you want to do is worship him, be submitted to him. All of a sudden, when you really understand what he's done for you, like you never have to live in hell. You get to spend eternity with him. You get to walk on streets of gold. Like, come on. You have eternity with Jesus Christ. How, what more do you want? So this morning, if you're, if, if you're here, if you're watching online or if you're here this morning and and you've never made that commitment for Jesus, today would be a great day. If, if you've been a Christian for a while and you go, man, I'm that guy. <laughs> I'm that person. I haven't, I haven't stepped all the way in the boat with him. And you want to do that today, man? Today's a great day to make that decision. I, I just, I, by the show of hands, anybody say, you know what? I, I, I need to do that, man. I need to do that. I need to, I need to move in that direction. I need to go all the way in the boat. Amen. Let's go all the way in the boat. He's done so much for us. Amen. Father, thank you for your word today. Thank you that you give us an opportunity to repent. God, you're so awesome. You give us an opportunity to walk away from the sin of the world, to walk away from the lifestyle of the world and come running to you. Today, Lord, many hands went up. You saw them, Lord, that said, you're first in my life, and I want to live like you're first in, that you're first in my life. And Lord, thank you. Thank you for giving us that opportunity. I just ask your blessing today on each and every person that's here. Lord, thank you for moving in our lives this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.